Well, thank you to Amy for starting us off on this Easter service with such a powerful piece. As we see up on the screen, risen, death, where is your sting? And if Jesus stayed in that tomb after his death on the cross on Friday, then yes, death would have been the victor. Death would still hold that sting over us. But as we know, what makes Easter is Jesus rose from the grave. And that is what we are celebrating today. And we're just so thankful that you're able to tune in and watch online with us. It is our prayer today that the music, the prayers, and the messages today just speak to your heart, give you the strength, give you the perseverance, give you what you need to keep going and persevering, knowing that good news is what is getting us through. So let us start off this Easter service with welcome to this house.
let us sing, We Come to Ask Your Forgiveness.
Janet for our special music. We've been journeying through the season of Lent and Good Friday, looking at our responsive readings, each time with a different symbol. Today, the symbol is the lily, a reminder to us of the gift of eternal life. Let us join in our Easter Sunday liturgy. Lord Jesus, you left the tomb on that Sunday morning, and all Mary Magdalene saw was emptiness. Lord Jesus, we have all had our share of experiences feeling empty. Lord Jesus, you replaced that empty feeling with joy for Mary Magdalene. Lord Jesus, Easter reminds us that hope and joy can be found in you, even after experiencing loss and emptiness. Lord Jesus, you are our risen and living Lord. Hallelujah. 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 You are indeed our risen Lord and God. How blessed we are have you in our lives. Amen. Amen. Well, we've been journeying through the various psalms to pick out memory verses, and Psalm 18 is a really great psalm if you get a chance to go through today, because it's a psalm of deliverance, a psalm where David reflects back on his many experiences and can see the many times that God's mighty hand has delivered him through difficult situations. Now, starting in verse 1, David starts off with true praise for God. For this is how he starts off, verse 1. I love you, Lord, my strength. Isn't that a great way to start off a song? I love you, Lord, my strength. And then he uses this analogy to go into verse 2. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, my Savior. My God is my rock, in whom I find protection. Now, verse 2 keeps going on, but I just want to pause here for a moment. Do you see the repetition of my? That personal relationship. And it's no wonder that by Psalm 18, he's already starting to use these words, my fortress, my savior, my God, my rock. No surprise. Then when we get to Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. He knows how important it is that it's not religion. It's a relationship that God wants to have that personal relationship with him. And what does that personal relationship do? David knows that God is his deliverer. He is my rock, my fortress, my Savior, in whom I find protection. And as you think of that image of rock, don't we think to Easter Sunday? And you remember that large rock, that large stone that was rolled in front of Jesus' tomb? And what was the reason for it to be put there? The Roman soldiers didn't want anybody to come in and steal Jesus' body. No. It was put there to try to keep Jesus in. <laughs> what did God do? What did the Father do on that Sunday morning? Roll the stone away so Mary Magdalene and Peter and John could peer in and see the tomb was empty. But Psalm 18, verse 2, doesn't end with just there. He also goes on to say, He is my shield, the power that saves me, and my place of safety. You see, just in that verse, the many ways that David acknowledges that God delivers him. He is my rock, my protection, my shield, my savior, and my place of safety. We all go through our times of challenges, our times of difficulties, and to have a memory song like this, where we know that God, my God, my savior will deliver me. Isn't that an important memory verse that we can have to remind us? We have a rock, we have a shield, we have a fortress that will always be there for us. Our memory verse on this Easter Sunday morning. Well, story time and pondering time. And very shortly, 
We're going to be looking at the story where Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early on that Sunday morning. And as she went to the tomb, I want to focus today and have you ponder today on what she was carrying in her hands at various moments. As she went to the tomb, she was carrying spices. Now, it was an act of respect, an act of remembrance, but they weren't resurrection spices, no. They were burial spices. She was going, expecting, to honor Jesus by anointing his already dead body with spices. And what does it symbolize? What do we recognize by the fact that Mary Magdalene was holding on to carrying spices early on that Sunday morning? Doesn't it symbolize how we carry at times hurt and grief and loss and setbacks and tragedy in our lives? And as she was going to the tomb that Sunday morning, the fact that she was carrying those spices, it's a symbolizing of how we too carry loss and hurt and setbacks and tragedies in our lives. And as we're about to read in just a few short moments, she went back and told Peter and John and the other disciples what she had seen, that the tomb was empty, and she came back. But this time, she wasn't carrying spices, no. This next time, she was carrying what I think is best described by this box of Kleenexes, her emotions, tears, as we're about to see. When she came back to the tomb the second time, she was asked on two separate occasions, why are you crying? And as we carry those spices that recognize the hardships, the setbacks, don't we have to also acknowledge the times we are carrying our emotions? Those moments we break down. The moments of tears. The moments that we just can't hold anything back. It's just our emotions are getting the best out of us. And that's what Mary was carrying the second time when she went back to the tomb. But as we know and we're about to discover, she heard her name called, Mary. And at that moment, she realized, she recognized who was calling her name. And from that moment forward, she was carrying something else for the rest of her life. The promises of Scripture. The truths of Scripture. Hadn't Jesus foretold that yes, he would suffer and die, but three days later rise back to life? A promise fulfilled. And here's Mary Magdalene. She was given the honor of being the first person to see Jesus risen, to see Jesus alive. And she clung to Jesus, but from that point onward, wasn't she also clinging to Scripture, the truths, the promises of God's words? And as we journey through life, something we have to decide is this. In those moments that we're carrying those spices, that we go through tragedy and setbacks, in those times when we might be carrying the Kleenex boxes and carrying our emotions, those overwhelming feelings that just hit us so hard, are we also carrying God's Word? Are we also carrying God's promises? Because as Mary Magdalene discovered that day, there's one sure way to get over those feelings of tragedy and setback. There's one sure way to get over those tears and suffering and anguish, and that is the promises of God. So as you ponder the story, I ask you to ponder, are you carrying God's promises with you through good times and bad, through the times of rejoicing, but also through the times of weeping? Because as we can discover, God's word, will get us through those times so much more better. Just like the psalmist David said, my rock, my savior, my salvation. Story time 
pondering time. I get to invite us now to sing, I danced in the morning. She would hear her name called, 
and seek and cling to the risen Lord. John 20, verses 1 to 18. Early on thy first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciples started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to where they were staying. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, Woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. He asked her, Woman, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me, where you have put him, and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You know, I've often wondered if something that maybe the disciples or some of his followers or some people said about Jesus was this. That when Jesus shows up, you just never know what will happen. Why do I say that? Because as you look at many examples from the Gospels where Jesus showed up to places, you just never knew what to expect. Take, for instance, when he showed up to the Jordan River while John the Baptist was baptizing people there. What did Jesus do? He agreed to be baptized. And all of a sudden, heaven opened up. The Holy Spirit came forth down upon Jesus in the form of a dove. And the Father spoke, This is my beloved Son who brings me great joy. Who would have ever expected when Jesus showed up that day that all these things would have happened? Or, you remember when Jesus showed up to a wedding in Canaan? And then, as he was there, the bride and groom ran out of wine for their guests. And Jesus was made aware of it. And it was there that he provided his first ever miracle, turning the water into wine. Who would have ever thought that when Jesus showed up to that wedding, that would be the first time that he would ever do a public miracle. And then, he showed up in his first year to the temple during the Passover. In John chapter 2, we discover that when he showed up, he cleansed the temple for the very first time, turning over the money changers' tables, chasing up the vendors and the animals. Who would have ever thought that when Jesus arrived at the temple for the Passover, that that's what he would have done? You just never know what would happen when Jesus shows up. He showed up at the home of Peter. and discovered 
that Peter's mother-in-law was sick. So what did Jesus do? He healed her. They didn't know that that's what would happen when Jesus showed up at Peter's house. And then, Jesus showed up at home in Capernaum. And while he was there, he was teaching, and the next thing we know, that an opening was made in the roof. A man who was crippled and lame was lowered down on a mat, and Jesus forgave his sins. That's the last thing the religious leaders would have ever expected. And they got into a debate with Jesus, and then he said to the man, I tell you, pick up your mat and walk. And he did. Who would have ever thought when Jesus showed up at that home in Capernaum that all of those things would have happened? But they did. Because Jesus showed up. Or how about when Jesus showed up at the synagogue in Nazareth? Was handed the scroll from Isaiah, opened it, and began to read. And then said, this day, this prophecy has now been fulfilled. Who would have ever thought? That when Jesus came to the synagogue that day, that that prophecy would have been fulfilled. Or how about when Jesus arrived at a graveyard and they found a man there who was possessed by a legion of demons. And what did Jesus do? He drove all the demons out of that man and they went into a herd of pigs. Over 2,000 pigs went over the side of a cliff. Who would have ever thought something like that would have happened when Jesus showed up? But he did. Story after story after story. You see, incredible things happened whenever Jesus showed up. People were healed. People were taught. We see miracles began to happen. But if the story ended there, people would still have this question. Jesus could do some exceptional things. But was he really the Son of God? And what I mean by that is this. So yes, he showed up at the Jordan and stood side by side with John the Baptist. But is he any different than John the Baptist? A man blessed by God, a prophet? Or they could look at the many times Jesus healed people and say, so, he could do healings. But is he any different than a physician or a doctor? Doctors and physicians can heal people, so how is Jesus that much different? We're saying, they looked at Jesus' miracles where he provided, like turning the water into wine. Couldn't they just say, I know of others who can provide for my needs, or can provide for this situation or that circumstance? Is Jesus any different than that? Or how about when Jesus forgave sins? They could say, well, I know priests forgive people of sins. So is Jesus any different than a priest? You see, if all these stories just ended there, people would still question, is Jesus really the Son of God? If Jesus is going to prove to us that he really is the Son of God, then he must do something that deals with our ultimate dilemma, Funerals. Death. Isn't that our ultimate dilemma? The whole question of death. Does death hold the final power, the final victory? So why did Jesus show up to funerals and do unexpected things? Because just as Jesus showed up to some of those situations I told you before, as you read through the Gospels, we discover three times that Jesus showed up to funerals. The first time was as they were coming to the village of Nyan. And at that moment, he saw a funeral procession. It was the procession of a young man who had just died. His mother had already lost her husband. She was a widow, and now she had lost her son. The most desperate situation in those days and times for a woman to have lost a husband and now a son. Jesus went over to her and said, Why are you weeping? Why are you crying? It doesn't that sound like an insensitive question? Unless Jesus knew something that she didn't. Jesus touched the coffin and said, I tell you, get up. And the young man did. He 
He sat up and he began to talk. I know you've been to a funeral. Have you ever seen that? Have you ever been to a funeral and you've seen somebody sit up and began to talk? This time it happened. Why? Because Jesus showed up. And then you might recall the story of Jairus, an official at a synagogue who had a 12-year-old daughter who was gravely ill, and he came to Jesus and begged him to come and heal his daughter. Well, on the way, they heard the news that their daughter had passed away, but Jesus still went. He still showed up at Jairus' house, and when he got there, he saw so many mourners gathering who were weeping and wailing, and Jesus said to them, why are you crying? Why are you weeping? She is just asleep. It seems so insensitive, doesn't it? Unless he knew something that they didn't. He went into the room. He took the little girl's hand and said to her, little girl, I tell you to get up. And she did. She not only got up, she began to walk around and she began to eat something. But let me ask you, do you see that happen? With somebody who is dead, all of a sudden gets up, begins to walk around and eat something? No. Unless Jesus shows up. And the other time that Jesus showed up to a funeral was at Lazarus' too. And remember, Lazarus had already been dead four days before Jesus arrived. And as he stood with Martha at the tomb, he said to Martha that your brother will rise back to life. And she agreed, but she thought it would be the resurrection of the dead after Jesus comes again. But no, Jesus did something, and she did. That Jesus was about to raise her brother back to life. He stood at the tomb and said, Lazarus, come out. And the next thing we see in that passage is Lazarus came out of that grave, still wrapped in all the grave clothes. Do you see a man dead for four days? All of a sudden walk out of his tomb? No, unless Jesus shows up. So why did Jesus show up to funerals? to show he has the answer to the power that death has over us. That Jesus can bring life where there's death. And that Jesus holds the keys to life and death. And if he had proven that enough in those three examples, didn't he prove it that day when he rose from the dead? On that Sunday morning, when Mary Magdalene went to the tomb, one thing she did not expect was a resurrection. And as I mentioned in the story time, pondering time, what was she was carrying was burial spices, not resurrection spices. And you can understand why. Since that Friday, joy had been taken away from Mary Magdalene. She was at the foot of the cross, watching as Jesus was crucified. She was there at the foot of the cross, putting a consoling arm around Mary as she was experiencing the grief and loss and death of her son. She followed Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus as she saw where they placed Jesus' body. And over those next hours and days, she wept. She mourned. There was no joy. There was loss. There was grief. There was sadness. And when she got to the tomb that morning, when she saw that the body was gone, the last thing she believed was in a resurrection. No. Remember what she believed, that somebody had stolen Jesus' body. So she went and told the disciples. And she got back after Peter and John had already left. When she arrived, she peered in herself. And this time, she saw two men dressed in white robes. And they asked her a question. Why are you crying? Doesn't that sound familiar? Doesn't that question ring a bell? Do they know something that she doesn't? And once again, you hear her say that she believes somebody has taken her Lord. Once again, she hears those words. Why 
Are you crying? And this time she thinks it's the gardener who's standing behind her. Again, in sensitive words, unless the person asking it knows something that she doesn't. And then, when she heard her name called, she realized it was Jesus, the risen Lord. And at that moment, gone was the sorrow, replaced with joy. Gone was worry, now replaced with worship. Gone was disbelief, now replaced with belief. Why did all that transpire and happen? Because Jesus answered the ultimate question that we all struggled with. Does death hold the ultimate victory? No. Jesus can bring life where there is death. That Jesus holds the keys to life and death. He proved it when he showed up to funerals and he showed it with his resurrection on that Sunday morning. And because of that, doesn't Easter Sunday show us that Jesus is Lord over everything in our lives? He is Lord to provide for us forgiveness for our sins. He is Lord when it comes to providing for our needs. He is Lord when it comes to healing us, whether it's of our spiritual selves, our emotional selves, and our physical well-being too. And he is Lord when it comes to life and death. Jesus is the Lord over everything in our lives. And as we see from Easter and all of the stories leading up over those three years, whenever Jesus showed up, you never knew what to expect. So shouldn't we want Jesus to show up in our lives every day? Shouldn't we want Jesus to be in our lives every moment, every day? But here's the reality. We don't always make that choice. We don't always want Jesus to be there at every moment. No, there are some of us as believers who say, Jesus, I want you there when I need you. I want you to make my will happen. Or I want you to answer prayers by my timing. But show up when I need you. I don't want you to be present. I don't want you to be Lord over everything in my lives. We kind of compartmentalize our hearts to Jesus. You know, Jesus, I'll give you this area of my heart. I'll give you that area of my heart. But these two areas are off limits. I'm not going to make you Lord over those aspects of my life. You see the mistake of doing that? We're not making him Lord over everything in our lives. And if we truly want to be blessed, if we truly want to experience all there is that comes with a relationship with the Lord, then we have to do what he has proven. He is the Lord over everything in our lives. If we should be wanting, we should be desiring for him to come and be part of every moment of every day. So how do we do it? Well, we follow the examples as we see from those earlier stories. The reason why Jesus showed up some places, like that wedding in Canaan, they invited him. They invited him to be part of their special day. The reason why he went to Jairus' house, Jairus sought him out. He went and pleaded and begged for Jesus to be present and Lord over this situation. And sometimes, Jesus just shows up unexpectedly. But don't we need to every day, as soon as we get up, say, Jesus, I want you to be Lord over my life this day. To make sure each day you show it by spending time in prayer. By spending time reading his word. By making sure on the Sabbath that you show you are the Lord of the Sabbath. And that's why I'm here to worship you. To make sure that you do what you can to make Jesus part of every moment of every day. And when you do that, don't be surprised that some moment Jesus does something surprising. Jesus does something totally unexpected. And when it happens, 
You just shake your head. And you smile and you say, my Lord, my Savior, my God. Easter Sunday shows us that Jesus is Lord over everything in our lives. And let me ask you, are you truly following the gift of Easter, making him Lord over everything in your life? God bless and amen. Let us join now in our prayers of the people on this Easter Sunday. Let us pray. Gracious and all-loving God, we know on that Easter Sunday morning, Jesus' followers and disciples were filled with grief. They were still filled with shock and fear and worry. But you had a surprise that the tomb would be empty and that you, just as promised, rose to life. And there must have been such a smile on your face as you appeared to Mary Magdalene. The two followers on the road to Emmaus and the disciples that night in the upper room to just show the wounds and the scars that, yes, indeed, you were faithful to that promise, that you bring life when there's death, and that you hold the keys to life and death. Thank you today, Jesus, for reminding us that you are Lord over everything and for encouraging us, if we're not already so doing, to just open our entire lives, our entire days, to making you Lord, to wanting you to be part of every moment of every day. And I know, God, that when we do this, you'll do some things that are expected, like always be there for us, fulfilling your promise, but you're going to do a few things unexpected, and that will just put such a smile and a blessing in our lives. So thank you for this powerful message. Thank you for this truth, and help us to make sure we are making you Lord over everything in our lives. We want to continue our prayers, Lord, for what's going on right now, this third wave of this pandemic. And we know it's very serious, it's very critical, and it's been emotionally hard for so many people. It's been a long year and a bit, a lot of highs, a lot of lows. But we know with another shutdown, people are struggling. We want to pray this day for the businesses that have had to close. We think of restaurants, we think of maybe some small businesses that were just struggling as it was and now to face this again. Help them to deal with their frustration and their anger and disappointment. We pray for our frontline workers, how exhausted they must be. We know that this is the last thing they wanted to do was a third wave. They would rather see the numbers down and things get better and better. Be with them, God. Help them through this frustrating time as well. We pray that people would use good and common sense. We know common sense is a gift that you give us, God. It's one of the many wisdoms that you offer to us. And we just pray, God, that people will not act selfishly through this, but take this seriously. To do their part so we can move on. Get enough people vaccinated, get enough herd immunity that things can return to some form of normal. And we know, God, what we need right now is a resurrection. Through all the bleak and difficulty and sadness and despair that is going on, and we just pray that the same power you used to raise your son back to life will be at work to powerfully help us through this very difficult time. We pray for our children. We know that some of these cases are getting back into the schools right now. And we just pray for your hedge of protection around the schools to keep our children safe because as we know and are hearing, they need to be there for their own emotional and personal stability and well-being. So we pray for our children. We pray for our teachers. Be with those who are struggling emotionally. We know there are many who are just with angst and worry and fear. Help them, God. Just as you helped the disciples through Good Friday and Easter Sunday. 
But we pray for the sick. There's so many going through illness and they're still trying to recover, whether it's from COVID or other health matters. And we just pray, God, for your power of healing to come into their lives. Thank you for Easter. We know it's a different Easter than what we would want and wish for, but it's still Easter. We still have the promises and truths and good news of Easter. And help us, God, to be people of Easter, going into this world, holding faithfully on to your promises. We offer our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. Let us now say, He lives, He lives. Let us join now and go now in peace. 